not in that grave anymore. And you want to know something? That is what sets this faith apart from every other faith in the world. There's a billion religions. There's only one empty tomb. Amen. That's right. You can go to Muhammad's grave. He's still there. You could go to the grave of any number of Buddhas. They're still there. You could go to any national leader that is regarded as a god. I don't care if it's a Chinese emperor or Kim Jong-il or whomever. They're still in the tomb. Years ago, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said God is dead. Guess what? It's 2024. Nietzsche's dead. Jesus is alive. Amen? 2,000 years ago, the most unique person who ever lived made some of the most unique claims that have ever been made. Man has had a problem since the garden. We had a sin problem. We were under the curse. It bound us to death, spiritually, physically, eternally. And then this man came along and he said, there's going to be a means by which you get to escape that. It's going to be through my death. And he did not leave it to us to determine whether or not he was telling the truth. He gave us a confirming sign as to the fact that he is who he said he is and that he did what he said he would do. And that sign is simply this. In three days, he would rise from the grave. And it is the most important event, is the watershed event of all of human history. It's split time in half. Everything up until that moment of his resurrection, we call that B.C., before Christ. Everything after is A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. Now, today, we've changed the names of those halves of time. We call them common era, before common era, but they can't deny that the event that cut it all in half was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And many people say, well, does it really matter that he physically rose? Maybe it's just a symbolic thing. Maybe it's just a spiritual thing. What matters is his life, his teaching. Let me say unequivocally to you today that the death, the physical death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the non-negotiable of the Christian faith. Without it, my job is pointless. You shouldn't even need to be here today because all of this would not matter unless he rose from the grave. And he did indeed. It was a real event. It happened in time. It happened in history. There were real flesh and blood personalities that were witnesses to that empty tomb. It happened. And today, I'm going to show you how it happened. We're going to walk through the New Testament together. I'm going to go back and forth between some of these Gospels. And we're going to see this event that happened in history. Would you look with me? Luke 23, verse 50 this is where our narrative begins today. By the time you come to Luke 23, verse 50, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Jerusalem. Jesus has been pronounced dead. That's very, very important that we establish that he was dead because there's theories out there. You know, the reason that body wasn't in the tomb is because Jesus didn't really die. You know, they say he, he just fainted. He fainted. There's this thing that's been posited called the swoon theory. Is that the silliest sounding theory you ever heard of? The swoon theory? That sounds like a book somebody wrote to teach you how to make somebody fall in love with you. <laughs> they say he just got resuscitated. Listen, this is a man that was flogged with a cat of nine tails. This is a, a device. There's a handle and leather straps. They've got bits of stone and glass and metal, and they pull the flesh off of a man's back. 39 lashes with a cat of nine tails. It would take 40 to kill a man. After that, they nail him to a cross. He hangs there for six hours, and at the end of that, they thrust a spear into his side, and blood and water flow. That is the confirmation that death has occurred. He's dead. And then we see another man come along who puts his reputation and his career on the line. Look at verse 50. It says, Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea, he was a member of the council. That would be the Jewish ruling body. The, the Sanhedrin is what we call that. It says he was a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. This man, Joseph, is a Jewish aristocrat. He's called righteous here. That means he keeps the law. 
He's also called good. That means he goes not just to the letter of the law, but to the heart of the law. He's a good man. He's a benevolent man. He's a kind and loving man. Luke says he's looking for the kingdom of God. That means he's always on the lookout for the Messiah. And it just so happens he's identified the Messiah as Jesus of Nazareth. Another gospel says that he's a secret follower of Jesus. Why secret? Because he's got a career. He's got a reputation. He knows if he publicly aligns with this carpenter from Nazareth who is so hated, his career is over. His reputation is kaput. And so ambition has silenced him until now. Something about the death of Christ has changed this man. And he is stepping out of the shadows because he's recognized it's better to have the whole world hate you and God be pleased with you than to have everybody love you and God be ashamed. And that's a lesson for us, isn't it? Sometimes you ask people, tell us about your faith, and they say, oh, that's personal. Hogwash. It's not, pers- it's not private. It may be personal, but it's not private. Christ did not die in a private place. He died in a public place. Heaven and hell are not private institutions. The Israelites, when they were delivered from Egypt, they put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, front of their house, for all to see. We are covered by the blood of the lamb, and we need to be vocal about that. Amen? And so this man comes to Pilate, and he brings with him a buddy. He's gone out, and he's got himself a buddy who is also a secret follower of Jesus by the name of Nicodemus. And what these two do together, we Westerners cannot fully appreciate. They go outside the city on Passover, and they go to retrieve a dead body. Now, no Jew is going to touch a dead body on such a holy day. To do so would make you unclean. Not to mention, this is somebody that the state has just executed as a criminal. But Joseph goes and he takes this body down. Now, to remove a body from the cross, what you have to do is you have to go up on a ladder and you have to take this dead man's hands, his bloody hands, and you put them in your hands and you pull them off the spikes. And as this body slumps forward, his bloody brow touches your brow, his bloody side touches your side, his bloody feet touch your feet. You put your arms around his bloody back where the scourge had been laid across it, and you are now covered in his blood. You have identified with his death in a very visual way. That's what Joseph has done right here. But it's not merely that that he does. He takes him down and he puts him in his very own tomb, an unused tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Now, he's been soiled in this man's blood. That alone is not going to prohibit him from participating in Passover. He can go through a cleansing ritual. But when he puts this man in his own grave, he's identified with Jesus Christ for the rest of his life. And you don't read about Joseph after this moment in your New Testament. As far as the world's concerned, he's a dead man. And so in John 19, we see what happens next. His compatriot Nicodemus, it says, who also had come to Jesus by night, comes bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. And so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Let me explain what these spices are. He takes myrrhs and aloes, and these are in the form of It's sort of a gummy, rosin-like substance. It would be a little lighter than, well, than Play-Doh. And it would be aromatic. And they would take this substance and they would grease down the body of the deceased. And then they would take linen cloth and they would wrap up that body. And as they did so, they would pack in these rosins, these aromatic substances. And they would wrap the corpse in this this pleasant smelling substance. And what that would do is that would mask the scent of decay as the body rots in that tomb. And so by now we come to Matthew uh, 27. And at this point, as they've gone off and they've buried Christ in a tomb, the Pharisees come to Pontius Pilate. And they've heard by now that Jesus has made several claims. And in Matthew 27, verse 62, it says, the next day after the day of preparation, the chief priests... And the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how this imposter had said while he was still alive, after three days I would rise and therefore order the the tomb to be made secure 
until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he is risen from the dead. And the last fraud shall be worse than the first fraud." And they understood something. They understood that of all the claims that Jesus has made, they can dismiss all that. They can do away with that if he stays in the grave. See, they understand something even a lot of Christians don't understand today. We try to argue the validity of the claims of Christ. They're just saying, look for the body. If his body's in that grave, he's dead. If his body's in the grave, he's a sinner. If he's a sinner, he's not the Messiah. And so they know if the disciples take that body, then people will think that he rose from the grave. People will think that he is who he said he was. And so in verse 65, Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. And so they went and they took the tomb and they made it secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. And so they've already at this point rolled a stone in front of that tomb. I'm going to talk more about that stone in just a moment. But then what they do, they do two things after that. They put wax on the front of that stone and then they put a seal on that wax. It's the seal of the Roman Empire. And it's meant to deter people from entering that tomb. Much like a crime scene, you'd see uh, yellow police tape in front of a crime scene. Do not enter. Now, that tape's not going to keep you from entry, but the authority that that tape represents makes a statement. If you cross, you're breaking the law. There's going to be consequences. This seal made a statement. Do not enter. If you do, you die. And not only did they put a seal there, they put Guards there, not Jewish temple guards. No, they sent trained killers from the fortress of Antonia. These are Roman guards. They are lethal, and they're there, and there's more than one. There's at least two. Why? So that one can't conspire to enter that tomb. There's going to be a witness there. And so you've got a stone, you've got a seal, and you've got guards. And now what you do is you've moved ahead toward Matthew 28. And the body of Christ has been in that tomb, and he is there on Friday night, and he is there on Saturday morning, and he's there Saturday afternoon, and Saturday evening, and into the third day after the crucifixion. And Matthew 28, verse 1 says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week. Why do we celebrate Christ's resurrection on a Sunday, on the Lord's Day? This verse right here, it's after the Sabbath. The first day of the week. Okay, after the Sabbath meant that a certain amount of time had passed since the end of Sabbath. When does Sabbath end? It ends at sundown on what we call Saturday night. If you go down to Jerusalem and you're there on the Sabbath, all the shops are closed up tight. There's no activity on the street. And then when the sun goes down, everybody opens back up and you go down to Ben Yehuda Street and there's a party. Well, this is long after the Sabbath had ended And it's the first day of the week. The Jews didn't have names for their days. They didn't call it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They called it first day, second day, third day in relation to the Sabbath. So this is the first day after the Sabbath. That means it's Sunday. It's today. And what happens then is that there is a significant thing communicated that Jesus would rise the day after the Sabbath. Is there any significance to that? I would submit to you that the Sabbath day that Jesus' body is in that tomb is the very last God-sanctioned Sabbath day. The Sabbath would be a day of rest. From the beginning, we see the Lord rest on the seventh day after creation gives us a model for our work week. But I believe that Sabbath day was the final Sabbath day God would ordain. And from that moment forward, guess what our Sabbath would be? It would be Christ himself. As believers, Hebrews 4 says he is our Sabbath. He is our rest. All who know him rest in him. It's constant. It's not a day. We don't gather. This is not our Sabbath. This is the Lord's day. But it doesn't even matter when we gather. We gather when we gather, but we rest in Jesus always. And who is it that comes to the tomb first? As you read the gospel accounts, you're going to see different details. It's going to be laid out differently. I'm going to harmonize it all for you so that you see who got to the tomb when and what happened each time. Look with me in Matthew. It says that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. The men 
have exited stage left. Nicodemus, Joseph, they're gone. Now you got some ladies at the tomb. Mary and Mary. And Mary is one of the most common Jewish names. So many Marys in the Old Testament. Moses has a sister named Miriam. The New Testament version of that is Maria. We pronounce it Mary. The most famous Mary, you know, as the mother of Jesus. But there are many others. You've got Mary, the, uh, the wife of Clopas. You've got Mary, the mother of James, the less one of the disciples. But the most famous Mary, other than the mother of Christ, is Mary Magdalene. And this is a common girl from a common city. She hails from Magdala. Her name derives from the city from which she hails. Magdala is this town up in the north of the Sea of Galilee. And so her name is based on where she's from. It's kind of a street name. It's kind of like Jenny from the block or <laughs> Betty from Burlington, all right? And Magdala didn't have a good rep. None of those Galilee towns had a good rep. They were irreligious. There was a lot of Gentiles up there. Uh, Nazareth is up there. Can anything good come from Nazareth, they would say. Magdala doesn't even make it into the New Testament. The only time you see it referenced is in the name of this very common woman. Who is Mary Magdalene? Uh, she has a sketchy background. Tradition says she's a former prostitute. We don't know that she was. The Bible never tells us that. But we do know, one of the Gospels says that she had seven demons in her at one point and that Christ delivered her when he found her. That makes her the most possessed person in all of the New Testament other than Legion, the Gadarene demoniac. And so she's come from a dark place and Christ found her and loved her, this low life, and she loved him, and she was devoted to him. And we read that she gave money to his ministry. She undoubtedly had not very much, but she gave what she had to support him. And when he's on the cross, she's there. And now that his body's in a tomb, she comes. And she comes on the third day after his crucifixion, and the sun is just coming up, the Gospels tell us. And she's accompanied by another Mary, and this Mary is the mother of James the Less, the wife of Alphaeus. And these two are the ones that Mary focuses on, but as it turns out, there are other women with them. John's gospel only mentions Mary Magdalene, uh, but when she recounts what she saw, she uses the pronoun we, which means there were other people with her. Mark's gospel adds uh, Zebedee's wife, a woman named Salome. She's the mother of James and John. Luke adds Joanna, Joanna is the wife of a guy named Chusa. He's a steward of uh, Herod. So she's kind of an elite. So you've got a, a mixed bag here, quite an interesting array of people hanging out. You've got this former demon-possessed, maybe a prostitute, hanging out with the wife of this elite steward, hobnobbing together, which shows you the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all the same. But their commonality was their love for Christ. So that's who shows up. Now, why do they show up? Why are they coming to this tomb? I'll tell you why they're not coming to the tomb. They're not coming to see a resurrection. They're not coming to see a risen Savior. Jesus had talked about rising, but his followers had never gotten their head around that. So they're not coming to see a resurrection. They came to see the tomb. Why? I want you to look at Mark 16, verse 1. It says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. They're not coming to see a risen Savior. They're coming to anoint a corpse. You say, well, I thought he was already anointed. Isn't that what Nicodemus and Joseph did with those, those uh, spices, the myrrh and the aloe and all of that, the 75 pounds and such? Yes, they did, but they did not embalm the body. The body was not violated in any way meaning it would still rot. And the Jews believed, oddly, that a spirit left the body after four days, that the spirit could no longer recognize the body once it had decayed, and so it would just leave. That's what they believed. That's why it was such a, a big deal for Jesus to show up at Lazarus' tomb four days in, because he'd begun to stink at that point. And so they just wanted to keep the body of Jesus preserved even just for a little while longer. And so they went out the night before 
at sundown when those shops had opened back up and they bought spices to anoint this body. And they show up at the tomb on this day. And before they arrive, we read in Mark 16, verse 3, that as they were saying to one another, they said, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They hadn't thought about this little detail. That shows you they weren't expecting a resurrection. They're, they don't, haven't even, hasn't even dawned on them how they're going to get the tomb open. There's a big rock in front of it. All graves outside the city would have had a gigantic stone. This would be a big round stone. It was typical of every grave. It weighed one and a half to two tons, this stone, the size of a mid-sized car, the weight of a mid-sized car, and it would block that entrance to the tomb. It would keep out grave robbers and animals and such. And they would park this stone off to the side, sort of uphill a little bit, into a trough that would be cut into the stone. And it would be on an incline, so it would be easier to get it down. It's very, very heavy. And it would take several men to remove it and move it back up that hill. So that was a deterrent to any grave robbers that might have a mind to enter the tomb. And so they're on their way. And before they get to the tomb, God has made other arrangements for their entrance. And he sends a localized earthquake. Look with me at Matthew 28 once again in verse 2. It says, And behold, there was a great earthquake. Now, what was the cause of this earthquake? It tells you. It says, For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. An angel arrives on earth at this exact spot like a bolt of lightning and a massive tremor ensues. And this powerful spiritual being takes that rock like it's an empty potato chip bag and throws it back up that hill, flips it over, and sits on top of it. Now, I want you to note the incredible contrast visually that you would see in that moment. Here you've got this massive two-ton stone, <laughs> and it's got this angelic keister parked right atop it. <laughs> on the front of that stone is the seal of Rome. <laughs> the seal of Rome carries the promise of death to the living. And atop it is an angel of God indicating the promise of life from death. That seal, if broken, there's going to be consequences. It promises death. But God promises that any who come by faith that believes in the empty tomb, that believes in the risen Christ, he will seal them for the day of redemption. Amen? That seal would ensure that that stone would not move, but we've got a stone. He's the rock of ages, the cornerstone, and he is unshakable. Amen? Now, why was that stone rolled away? I assure you, it was not to let Jesus out. This was not an exit. It was an announcement. God moved that stone so people could know when they looked in there that he was gone. He was gone. And so this happens before the women arrive. Now, this angel is described in verse 3. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. These hardened executioners are paralyzed at the sight of this angel. Have you noticed when angels appear in Scripture, they always say things like, fear not? You ever wonder why they say, don't, don't be afraid? I would submit to you it's because angels are freaky scary. Have you ever read descriptions of angels in the Old Testament? They are bizarre, man. In their natural state, some of them have four faces. They're described with the face of an eagle and an ox and a man and a, and a lion. Some of them have two wings, four wings, six wings. Some of them are covered in eyes. That hardly sounds like Roma Downey, y'all. <laughs> and so they appear in their natural state. They don't say fear not to these Roman soldiers. These guys get the full scary angel treatment. And they are paralyzed. They become as dead men. Now, at some point, no, uh, no doubt, they emerge from this paralysis and they flee because we don't see them mentioned when people come to the tomb. There's no mention of any guards. And so now, by now they're gone. And in John chapter 20, verse 1, says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran. She ran. She doesn't go in the tomb. She doesn't even look in the tomb. She just sees the stone rolled away, and she bolts. 
Why does she do that? Because she has no concept of a resurrection. As far as she's concerned, Jesus is dead, but he's not in the tomb. If the stone is rolled away, that means somebody's gotten to the body. He's been taken, and she runs off. There's no such thing as Christianity, this faith based on a resurrection at this point. So she runs, and so she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Remember, this is John writing. He never refers to himself in the... Uh, by name, he always calls himself in the third person, the one, and he likes that title, the one whom Jesus loved, which may sound arrogant to you, but I think John just saw himself the way Jesus saw him and would that we would see ourselves the way Jesus sees us as one whom he loves. But it is kind of funny when you read how John refers to himself. And they are with the rest of the disciples. Now, there are only 10 of them at this point. Ju Judas is dead. There's no 12 anymore. The fellowship has been broken. Judas has hanged himself. Thomas is not there. They're just hiding out. They're all distraught. And she comes to him and she says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. Who's they? She doesn't know. She's got no idea. They, is it somebody, they, the enemies of Christ. Her fear is they've pulled a William Wallace on Jesus' body. If you've seen Braveheart, that Scottish freedom fighter, William Wallace, who opposed England. When the British capture him, he's beheaded. They put his head on top of London Bridge. They send his limbs to the four corners of Great Britain to mock him and to declare their might there. She's afraid that's what they've done with her Lord. And so Peter, it says in verse 3, went out with the other disciple, John, and they were going toward the tomb. All right? So they're on their way to the tomb. Meanwhile, who's still at the tomb? The ladies. Minus Mary Magdalene. All these ladies are still there. And we look at Luke 24 in verse 3. It says, but when they went in, because they've decided to go in the tomb, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Well, now you've got two angels present, and they're not getting the eye-covered, freaky, four-faced version. They're getting this special diluted version that these angels have taken, this form that is non-threatening. And they're much nicer to them than to the guards, apparently. But in Mark 16, verse 5, it says, In entering the tomb, they saw a young man. So he appears as a handsome young man, and he's sit sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed, even though they looked like people. They were still alarmed. They didn't expect to see them in this tomb. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. And then come the sweetest three words in all of your Bible. He has risen. Amen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. All right. And so in this tomb, we are treated to a picture. You've got an angel at the, at the head of this slab where the body of Christ had been, and on this side, you got another angel where his feet had been. Angel, angel, and the place where God's sacrifice once was. I believe that is to remind us of something. When I went to Israel in every gift shop, I saw images and models of an object called the Ark of the Covenant. If you've seen Indiana Jones, you, you know what the Ark of the Covenant is. You've seen a depiction of it on screen. And it wasn't terribly inaccurate, quite frankly, because this was the box, the ark, that God commanded the Israelites to construct and overlay with gold while they were traveling through the wilderness. And inside that box, as it would later uh, be in the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem, within that ark, among other things, was the Ten Commandments, the law of God, the law that condemns us in our sin. And on top of that box was a lid, a golden lid. And they called this lid the mercy seat. And the mercy seat covered the law. And it would be the mercy seat upon which the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle the blood of sacrifice right there on that mercy seat. And on that mercy seat, facing one another, were two angels. One on this side, one on this side. Two cherubim. And God in his glory would look down upon his violated law, but he would see it through the mercy seat where a sacrifice had been made. And mercy would cover 
our violation of his law. And here in this empty tomb, symbolism has become reality. You've got an angel here and an angel here, and in between them was the place where the sacrifice of God covered our sin. Is that a beautiful picture? Amen. And in verse 7, these women get a special privilege from these angels. He says, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. What an amazing privilege these ladies have. You know, the Bible says salvation does not come through the accomplishments of men. It's going to start in Genesis, and it's going to be promised by the seed of woman. God always somehow finds a way to use a woman. The first time the term Messiah is ever uttered, it's on the lips of a woman. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, says that word for the first time. The announcement of the birth of John the Baptist is not made first to his father, Zechariah. It's made to his mother, Elizabeth, who sings of the one who would proclaim the Christ. When the birth of our Savior is announced, it is announced first and it is declared first not by his earthly father, Joseph. We don't even ever hear the voice of Joseph in your New Testament. We hear his mother's voice. Just the other night, Abigail Wilson painted before our very eyes during worship a painting of Eve in the garden. And there was a serpent, our ancient foe. And it would be after that fall in the garden that God would declare that it's going to be the seed of that woman who would crush the serpent's head. And right over here before your very eyes, she has painted part two of that painting set. And there is our Lord, the one who would crush the serpent's head. Amen. That's right. But God has seen fit to tie women into the story of Christ. It's quite amazing. And here we've got these unassuming, humble, Christ-loving ladies that are privileged to declare the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they go back to the apostles to tell them the good news. But I want you to remember, Mary Magdalene has already told them. So Peter and John are on their way. And we see them arrive. And as they're coming to this empty tomb, that's proof that many of the theories that you hear about why the tomb is empty just frankly don't hold up. Because one of those theories is that the disciples stole the body. Folks, the disciples are nowhere near this tomb. They're in no frame of mind to try to break into a tomb with armed guards and a heavy stone in front of it. They're not in any emotional shape to do that. And even if they were, every one of these disciples would be martyred for their belief in the resurrection. Do you know anybody willing to die for a lie? I don't. Some people say, well, maybe the Romans did it. Maybe the Jewish elites did it. That's ludicrous because this movement of Christ followers would emerge and it would be so overwhelming and they would try so hard to quash it, all they would have to do to put it down would be produce the body of the dead Jesus. That'd take care of that movement right there. And so they had nothing to do with it. Some say, well, maybe it was grave robbers that broke in and stole the body. Grave robbers have no interest in a corpse. There was nothing in that tomb of any value. All that remains in this cave are grave clothes. And speaking of grave clothes, I want to show you something amazing. In John chapter 20, verse 4, Peter and John, both of them were running together, but the other disciple, the other disciple, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Okay, John, we get it. You're the fastest. Peter's more of a distance guy, I guess. And it says, and stooping to look in, John saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon P Peter came. He says, get out of the way, John. And he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, because what would happen is they would wrap the body of the deceased from head to toe, except they would not cover his face. He would be wrapped up. And they would take these spices as they did so, and they would pack it in with the body. And over time, these spices would harden and solidify. And he'd be wrapped from head to toe with an opening for his face. And that wrapping, he would be almost like a mummy, and it would become this hard encasement, almost like an encrusted cocoon. And it would follow the contours of of the dead man's body. And then they would take 
that face cloth, they called it a napkin, they would put it over his face and they would tie it around the head to keep the jaw in place as the body would decompose. But notice it says in verse 8, when the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, he saw and believed. He believed. Meaning what? Meaning that he believed the body was gone simply? Did he believe that it had been stolen? No. It was the state of the linen cloths that were encrusted and hardened and in the shape of a body. It says that they were lying there, and the original words used imply that they were not on the ground, they were not torn asunder, they were not strewn about that tomb, they were left as they had been, undisturbed. When a body is encased in all of that, the only way to get it free, humanly, is to cut a slit in it lengthwise and yank that body out. You have to pry back the edges of that encasement of those hardened linen cloths. This had not been moved or disturbed in any capacity. It was still in the form of the dead man's body. But there was no body. It's as though... The Lord Jesus just passed right through those linens. He didn't tear them off like the Incredible Hulk. He just phased right through it. And then he took that linen napkin that covered his face and he folded it up neatly and he set it next to the linen cloths so that they could see inside that encasement that there was nobody there. And it says, when John saw that, he believed. And so would you, because that, my friends, is a miracle. All this to show that he rose. This was a miraculous thing. It was kind of like a little rapture in that tomb, you know? If the rapture were to happen today, these clothes right here are going to be empty of Scott. Okay? You believers out there, your wedding ring is going to be laying on the ground. No finger in it. All right? If you've got fillings in your mouth, you go, they stay. <laughs> if you're wearing a tie, that tie's still going to have a Windsor knot in it. You're going to be in glory. And if you're thinking about getting plastic surgery, be careful. <laughs> Everybody's going to know. <laughs> All this to show this is a real event, you see. It's a real event. Some say, well, he rose spiritually. It was his memory, you see, that had been raised. The Greek word for that is hogwash, all right? <laughs> this was a real event. It was supernatural. They didn't understand it, however. And so in verse 9, it says they didn't get this. And verse 10 says they went back to their homes. How come they didn't go and proclaim this from the rooftops that he had risen from the dead? They were confused. They believed, but they're processing it. You would be a little speechless, if you'd seen what they'd seen. Not to mention, there's some shame there. Peter had been hiding all throughout the crucifixion. And so they just, they just sort of, in a stupor, wander away from that tomb. There is now one person left at that tomb. It says, verse 11, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. My heart goes out to this woman she loves Jesus so much, but she does not understand what has transpired. She, she doesn't know that he's risen. She doesn't get it. All she knows is the tomb is empty. Her Lord is gone. She's distraught. Now watch. As she wept, it says, she stooped to look in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. We don't see that Peter and John saw these men, these angels, only the women had seen them. But she's so grief-stricken, she doesn't even recognize them as angels. Maybe they've dialed back their supernatural appearance so as not to alarm her. Either way, it doesn't register with Mary. And they said to her, verse 13, woman, why are you weeping? Now that's a rebuke right there. Angels love to rejoice. And the greatest event in human history has just transpired. And so they think everybody ought to be rejoicing. But this woman's in tears. Have you ever seen the movie uh, League of Their Own? 
I, I kind of imagine this angel speaking with the voice of Tom Hanks to Mary Magdalene. Are you crying? <laughs> There's no crying at the resurrection, you know. And she said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She still doesn't have the right perspective. She consumed with the reality of a fallen world where there's death. But folks, the resurrection overcomes the reality of our fallen world. Because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead one day is going to raise you from the dead. And if you have any loved ones who knew Jesus Christ and you mourned them at their death, you're going to see them again. Amen? Never to part. We will be raised incorruptible. We have that promise. But Mary doesn't understand any of that yet. All she knows is her Lord is gone. And she just wants to be where he is. And verse 14 says, having said this, she turns around and saw Jesus standing. Now this is a first. He has not appeared to anyone yet. He appears to her. But it says, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And he said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him. Now, the gardener? <laughs> the gardener. Why doesn't she recognize him? He's glorified. There's something here that, that presents a sense that he does not appear exactly as he did. Uh, later, he's going to be on the road to Emmaus. And those two men, it says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And so there's something about the, the resurrection body of Christ that is different. She definitely doesn't expect to see him. I'll say that much. She says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. I, my heart breaks for her. She's like, I just, I don't even care that he's dead. I don't care that he's hated. I don't care what state his body's in. I don't care if he's in pieces. I don't even know if I could carry him. Please, please, please tell me where he is and I will take him. I want him. The world may not want him. They've rejected him. I want him. I'll take him. Now listen. Jesus said to her, Mary. There are a billion Marys. It's the most common name in the Jewish world. He knows many Marys. There's his mother Mary. There's Mary the wife of Clopas. There's Mary the mother of James. But the way that he says her name, it's like she's the only Mary in the world. There's familiarity. There's affection. There's acceptance. When he looks at her, he doesn't see some common reject, former demoniac from a, a destitute and irreligious town north of Galilee that is despised. He says her name and no one says her name like this and she responds. It says she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, master. And this person is the first one to see the risen Christ. Does she sound familiar to you? She's just a nobody. She's just a commoner. She's no one special in the eyes of the world. She's not from anywhere special. She's come from a dark place. But she is seeking the Lord and does not recognize him until he says her name. Let me ask you a question today. Has the risen Lord called your name? Has he called your name? And here's the more important question. Have you responded? I want you to bow your heads with me right now. I want our prayer team to go ahead and come up at this point. Our pastors, if I've got any pastors in this room, you can come up too. Any of my elders, please come on up. I'm going to invite you right now. If you have never responded to the Lord calling your name. If you have never put your faith in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity right now, today, 
Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Right where you are, if you say, I believe that he died for my sin, and I believe that he rose from the grave to give me what I could not achieve, he's calling my name right now, and I want to respond. If that's you, in the privacy of your heart where you are, I want you to just pray. And you could pray along these lines. Now, it's not going to be these exact words that save your soul. But it's, it's, it's the sentiment of your heart, what you are expressing to the Lord where you are, your commitment to him. His grace saves you. Would you just pray along these lines, Dear Jesus, I know that you died for my sin. There's nothing special about me. I'm like Mary. But you love me like you love Mary. You died for me as you died for Mary. You rose so that I wouldn't have to face death. And I am trusting in what you did on the cross and at the tomb. I'm trusting in that for my eternity. Would you come into my life and be my Savior? In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Scott Graham, and we want to thank you for joining us as we reach, raise, and release genuine followers of Jesus Christ here at the Lamb's Chapel. Uh, if you want to know when a video drops or when we go live, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And send this video to someone who needs to hear it. And make sure you invite them to join you here with us live this week. We'll see you soon.